Hey y'all, this is David, the Georgia photographer, and today what I want to talk about is Nikon. See, I've been getting a lot of, in my feed, is I've been seeing a lot of talk about how Nikon is, you know, is headed out and they're not looking profitable next year. You see a lot of things like that happening and and you got to understand a little bit about business and macroeconomics and even microeconomics. Just a little bit of both will get you a long way towards understanding what's going on with Nikon and with Olympus even. You'll see in this entire, well, what's the right word, market as a whole in dire straits. That's what you keep hearing, okay? You keep hearing that over and over and over on all these videos. Well, I want to... I want to put a little bit of that to rest because honestly, it's not that big of a deal. It seems like it is. It really does seem like it is because on the surface, you're seeing all these things like I've got a print out here from Nikon that I've highlighted a line on because it says they had to restructure their projections because further contraction and competition of the market is expected compared to the initial forecast. What they're saying is, is the market is shrinking. There's a multitude of factors why, but the main ones are bridge cameras or what you'd call consumer cameras were basically extincted with the advent of high quality smartphone cameras. Nowadays, everybody has a camera in their pocket, so they don't have to buy the little cool pics or what was it, the ones that, that uh, Canon made? They made the Elf series, and I don't remember what they made for digitals, but you know, those little tiny pocket cameras that everybody bought in the late 90s, early 2000s were basically made obsolete with the smartphone camera. There's no need to have them. Everybody has a camera in their pocket now. So that kind of eliminated that particular market all So you slice that off of the entire industry, throw it in the trash. This industry suddenly just shrank a lot. The advent of high quality digital DSLR cameras in the early 2000s created a huge boom in beginner photographers who wanted to dabble in quality photography. Suddenly you eliminated that entire burdensome step of processing and developing film, which was also very expensive at the time. You know, a roll of film would be three, four dollars or two dollars or whatever it was. I don't even remember now. I haven't bought film in so long. But you know, you had the cost of the film, then you shot the film, which was a finite amount of information on a canister, you know, 36, 24 exposures is all you got. Then you had to take that film and you had to go somewhere and have it processed. Most people didn't process film at home and color film processing is much more complicated than black and white. Because of that, people just didn't really embrace photography as a hobby because it was a very burdensome task to get your photos back. And then you know, you had to wait a week or 10 days to see what you got, you know, you didn't, you could do one hour processing by the 2000s, but it was expensive. You paid extra for that. You go down to, to Revco at the time and you'd give them your canister of film. And if you told them you wanted an hour, you paid a little premium for them to go ahead and hurry and do your roll of film. The digital camera came to be, and it kind of matured enough that it was producing good photos. Suddenly, you had that instant gratification and basically you eliminate the post-processing cost to be able to see your photos. You didn't have to get them in print form. You didn't have to wait a week. You could literally put them in your computer and look at them right then. It was like the golden era of the digital camera came into its own. Everybody had to have that. Sales ran away up till about 2010, 2011 when it kind of pinnacled. My speculation is the reason it pinnacled in 2011, even though after 2011, we got some really phenomenal cameras, was mainly because the market was sort of saturated with high quality DSLRs that had already been made. You know, you already had a good decade of manufacturing and a camera body will last 20 years easy, if not longer, unless you do something to it and break it. You have these quality cameras that are still floating around in existence. Of course, the smartphone eliminated all of the little cameras. Well, you get some pseudo saturation 
And all these camera companies had built up their production lines to where they could feed that demand because they were trying to cash in on this. It was a it was a market bubble. If you look at at economics at all, a bubble in a market is when there's runaway sales on a product or or a service, you know, and there's a big boom temporarily on it, and then that bubble bursts and you have a big reset. A lot of times you see it in the housing market. You lot, you'll see it in real estate a lot. After 2011, 2012, 20, somewhere around in that period, you started seeing sales starting to decline. Well, the whole time you saw this, Sony was focusing on little DSLRs for a little while. Then they realized they couldn't really compete with Nikon and Canon on DSLR sales. It's just pretty much impossible because those behemoths kind of had that market sewed up. So what they done was they said, okay, let's build a different kind of camera that doesn't cost as much to manufacture, that we can control the form factor on, and that no one else is really doing. So they went to this mirrorless design and started really pushing that design. You know, at the time, Nikon had the one and I think Canon had one too, but I honestly don't know what it was modeled on. I don't remember its model name. I think the M50 or it might be the M series altogether was that kind of their version of it. The Nikon one didn't didn't take off. It was a real it was a real hit apparently in Japan, but it never really took root in the rest of the world, so no one really bought them. I'm assuming because of the plethora of lenses on the F mount that are available and F-mount DSLRs were so inexpensive, people just bought those. The Sony kept forging ahead. Now they had been making digital cameras and had been working outside of the box, you might say, for years prior to this. You know, they made the one that took the three and a half inch floppy disk. I think they even took one, made one that took a CD, a blank CD-ROM, and you could burn them to the CD as you took the photos. I'm pretty sure they made that camera too. I know they had the one that took three and a half floppies for memory, which is really forward thinking if you think about it, because then you could literally take the same memory and put it straight in your computer. Because at the time that was the standard media for a personal computer that was removable was a three and a half inch floppy disk. So Sony continues on. They start really making good cameras. They get the A5000 series and it starts getting a little traction. Then they come out with the A6000 series. And that's when they really started to get popular. Those little cameras were doing really well. Then they decided to make a full frame and they made the A7. It took off. Everybody loved it. It was able to have, it had the E-mount just like the little 6000s and 5000s. So the lenses were interchangeable between them. They started making a full frame glass. They just continued to improve it. And, you know, they made the A7, A7R, A7S. Then they made the A7 II. And that's when they started putting image stabilization in the camera. That's when it really took off. Honestly, Nikon and Canon were still gambling that DSLRs were the thing. They weren't embracing this mirrorless idea. They were watching it. If I had to guess, I don't know, I'm speculating here, but I would, I would speculate and say they were watching Sony a little they were paying attention to what sony was doing they were the whole time in the board meetings if i had to say that they were having board meetings about it, they were saying okay well, the nikon one really isn't moving let's focus on the d850 and the d810 and the d4 and all of these great cameras and the d5 and let's let's continue to manufacture really high quality dslrs that we know we're moving everybody loves the d750 let's continue to make these and We'll just kind of keep an eye on what Sony's doing and, and see how it unfolds. Well, then, literally, Sony blew up. They're, they're at like 40% of the market now. You know, they started releasing cameras in rapid succession with great improvements. And once you get to that point, they had the momentum. You're starting to see a lens collection. They come out with the G Master Series lenses. They're serious about this. At that point, I believe Canon and Nikon might have even called each other. I don't know. I believe it was at that point that they said, okay, this mirrorless thing is serious. We need to start working on this. And they both started developing mirrorless cameras at that point. I mean, they might have had them in R&D or might even have working prototypes that they was playing with. But I don't think they really threw R&D money at it until that A9 landed. I think that was when... Both of them realized we're losing this game and we need to pick up the ball and run with it. 
So after 2011, the market starts to shrink, but Sony is getting more of what the market, what's left of the market than the rest of the camera companies. You know, they're growing. At, to begin with, they weren't, but as time goes on, you see that pie growing on theirs. Even though the pie is shrinking, their slice is getting bigger. That's because they've gained, they've gained that momentum. You know, they're built, they've built a head of steam and they're moving forward with this. And it's very smart marketing on their part. Meanwhile, Nikon and Canon and most of the other camera companies, and Sony's the same, Sony's a consumer electronic company. They have their fingers in way more than just cameras. They're not banking on just that one product line to, to get them by. Well, neither is Nikon and Canon. There's way more than just cameras that they're banking their money on. They've got a lot more going on than that. So since they waited until Sony got very established in the mirrorless spectrum, to really bring mirrorless cameras out, they've gotten behind the eight ball on it. So now they're playing catch up with Sony is what they're doing. That's why you saw a Z7 and a Z6 and you saw an EOS R and then an EOS RP very shortly after is they're trying to come out with an A7 and an A7R more or less and basically compete with those models is what they were doing with that. And they did a pretty good job. I mean, these are nice cameras. Everybody complained about some of the features, including me. Nikon, if you're listening, bring out the AF-D to Z adapter. Build a little focus motor in the adapter so that we can run those screwdriver lenses. You're tripping over your own shoelaces by not having that adapter. It would sell. People are standing here waiting to buy that adapter because they have a enormous collection of AF screw drive focused glass and they have no way of focusing it on the Z camera. It's holding people back. I'm just going to say it. Anyway, rant over. Nikon is behind the curve. Their sales are lackluster. Their first cameras were okay, but not great. They were okay, but they're not great. They've learned to do firmware updates. Everybody was skeptical about firmware updates with Nikon because Nikon traditionally doesn't release firmware updates. You'll get one or two to repair some kind of serious flaw in a camera system, and that's it. You will you don't see them regularly where they're adding features like Fuji does or like Sony does. And Nikon has never really been about that. You didn't see all kinds of new focus mechanisms or feature sets built into firmware updates that they would just give you. It would be in the next camera. They've started to embrace that. The Z series cameras are getting pretty regular firmware updates, and that's a sign that they're spending money on engineering and the software so that you will actually see those updates. They're actually doing it. They're developing new cameras. The fact that the Z50 came out at all tells me that they're serious about this whole Z line. They're actually building all this. If I had to guess, they're eventually going to start tapering off the G series lenses and start focusing more heavily on Z series lenses is what you're gonna see. They'll have the legacy lenses for a while, 10, maybe 20 years even, they'll continue to make them, but you're gonna see less and less R&D put into those and more and more R&D put into the Zs, which is the S line. But what you're gonna see is, is the market's gonna contract to a certain size. And that's that core group of photographers, even with the new ones coming in, the old ones retiring out. And that group is gonna, stick with brands that they're familiar with and like, and you're, this brand hopping is something that YouTubers do. Typically, a working professional will stick with a brand until he retires, almost guaranteed. It's pretty rare to see them switch systems, mainly because they inherently know the system they're using and it's producing good results. That aside, if I had to guess, it's gonna contract back to about what the size of the market was in 2002, 2003, before the boom started. The bubble grew from about 2002 to 2011, so you're seeing a nine year bubble growth. And then nine years of, of shrinkage would be 2011 to 2020. So we're gonna see, I'm assuming we're gonna see the market kind of bottoming out about 2020. And then what you're gonna see is you're gonna see it starting to slowly grow again and it's gonna be normal growth now and not a bubble. The companies are having to figure out how much production they need to make and how many cameras that they can sell, how much market they can buy from the other manufacturers because it's a pretty tight market and it's, and it's pretty competitive. What you're gonna see is you're gonna see negative numbers for a couple of years and then you're gonna see them level off and starting to get in the green again and they'll start being profitable again. I don't think 
Nikon or Canon or Olympus for that matter. I really don't think Olympus is going anywhere, guys. I, they have their fingers in a lot too, you know? So they might not make as many cameras every year. You might start seeing limited runs to where they only make 50,000 of, of a model instead of 100,000 or 150,000 because they're looking at projected sales and they don't want to make way more than they can sell. So you'll, you'll see them start, they'll scale back to where it's profitable. I really think at the end of the day, Nikon's going to be fine. They're going to run in the red a little bit until they get the mirrorless system moving good. And then it'll be all, it'll be full steam ahead because they made a lot of money in that boom period. They made a lot of money and they've been doing stuff with that money. They've been doing R and D. So with that, this is David, the Georgia photographer. And now that you've put up with this long winded ramble, I appreciate it. And if you like, you know, if you like the video, thumbs up it. I appreciate it. <laughs> We have the Georgia Photographer Gathering on Facebook. If you want to join with the like-minded people who like to shoot photos and not talk about the camera industry as a whole failing, then go on over to Facebook. It's the Georgia Photographer Gathering. Anyway, I appreciate you guys watching, and until next time, get your camera out. Go take a picture with it, all right?